Please, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self publishing business. We're your hosts. I'm Stephanie. I'm Joni. So, in today's episode, we interviewed Adam Croft. And if you don't know who Adam Croft is, he has sold over 2 million books to date, and he is one of the most successfully independently published authors in the world. One of the biggest selling authors of the past few years, he has sold books in over 138 different countries, which is very impressive. It is. We love talking to Adam Croft. He's a big Kobo advocate. He's a big advocate for indie authors. So it was really great to be able to have a proper chat with him. He spoke to us quite a lot about going wide, about transitioning from exclusive programs into wide. We talked about the importance of the indie author community and about his author community Facebook group. We talked a little bit about his podcasts. He has a lot out there available for authors. So it was a great interview. We hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Adam, for coming on the podcast today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. I think a lot of our listeners already know who you are, but for those that don't, can you give us a little introduction to who you are and what you do? Well, I write crime fiction, psychological thrillers, mysteries mainly. I also do nonfiction for other writers. I've been knocking around now for about 10 years being indie published. And yeah, that's I'm about 30 books in, something like that. So yeah, I feel like a bit of a dinosaur at times, but uh, still having fun. So I'm not going anywhere. In the last, is it year or two years, maybe you've created a really strong author community with the Indie Author Mindset. When did you start that? Summer of 2018. So yeah, coming up for two years. It's something that I'd, I'd wanted to do for a while, but wanted to do in the right way. I didn't want to just be someone else who started doing courses and things like this. I didn't want to jump into it too early. A few people had asked me, but I was reluctant to do it because I wanted to make sure I put the fiction work first and I didn't want to neglect that, I guess, in terms of trying to make money from courses and what have you. So I did things a bit of a different way. I started with the community, the Indie Author Mindset Facebook group, and I have since uh, introduced some short courses that are normally about an hour, hour and a half long at most. And they focus on you know tight areas like writing blurbs and hooks or how to sell more books when you go wide. So you know rather than kind of big multi-hour, hundreds of dollar courses, I've tried to keep it a bit more bite-sized and a bit more accessible. I guess because I'm I'm known for being fairly blunt and to the point about things, so <laughs> I think it, it probably fits that brand quite well. There was something that you said recently, I think it was in the Facebook group that really resonated with me and I wanted to ask you about. I think it was something like competition in this industry doesn't exist. Mm. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that concept. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, you know, debates rear up in Facebook groups all the time, as anybody who uses social media will know. And yeah, it was a comment that an, an author had made about competition and it kind of struck me as a bit weird. And it, that the first thing I'd realized is that I hadn't heard that word. And considering we're effectively running a small business, I hadn't heard that word in, in months mentioned. And that really resonated with me. And I, I kind of sat back and thought about it. And it struck me that, I mean, it's something I, I already knew anyway, but which I, I don't know, it just seemed kind of quite philosophical at that moment, I think, that there, there is no competition. And books are impulse purchases. It's not like if you're buying a car, you'll go out, you'll have a budget, you will know you're only going to buy one car and you're going to not buy another one for another few years. Whereas with books, you may not even be looking for books when you go and buy books. You may see an advert somewhere that uh, sparks something and you, you buy it. They're, they're an impulse purchase. They're an impulse buy. You might go out looking for one book and come home with four or five. I, I think we've, we've all done that. I know I do that on a regular basis. So it's not the case that you know somebody's going to choose between one book and another. There's room for as many authors as want to write. There are always readers out there. And there isn't really any competition. I think most authors will know the feeling of saying yes I, I beat one of my friends in the in the rankings and you know i'm one spot above so and such a you know whatever big name author that's that's always nice but it's always in good jest and yeah that's what i love about the community it's such a, a helpful bunch of people and nobody you don't tend to get many egos or people who you know think they're better than the others because there's just no need for it it, it has no benefit and, and no place in the industry i think that's really true about the indie author community i don't think i've ever come across a community that's as supportive and as willing to be like hey this is what i've learned and i'm going to share that with everyone instead of mm. pouring yeah I th- yeah i think yeah authors in general i think that happens and in this industry in general i think on the trad side there might be a little bit more of it because you know people are kind of 
are fighting for stable places and contracts and what have you. But I think when you're an indie author and when you've got complete control over that and when everybody's in much the same boat and, and helping each other out, it's, it just feels like a, a much, much better place. And, you know, I've worked in quite a few industries over the years and it's by far the, the friendliest and most easygoing and most community focused industry I've, I've come across. Is that why you wanted to pursue indie publishing in the beginning or how did you kind of fall into it? Accidentally. Okay. <laughs> <the answer's> <laughs> that. <laughs> I wrote the first book in 2010, so 10 years ago now. And you know, self-publishing, indie publishing wasn't on my radar. I didn't realize it was a thing. I think the Kindle had only come out in the UK the year before. I don't, I don't know if we had Kobo over, over here at that point. I, I, I can't remember last week, never mind 10 years ago. And it was, it was something that I'd... I had not come across. I wrote the book and I thought, well, I'm probably going to end up, if anything happens with it, it will go through agents and publishers and what have you. And I came across self-publishing and I think it was, um, there were things like Smashwords, I think was around at the time and a few different outlets like that. And I thought, well, this is a good way of putting, because it was the first thing I'd written, it's a good way of putting something out there and seeing what people think of it and see if there might be something in this, see if I can improve the writing and you know, maybe further down the line in a few years' time, go through a publisher. And the first book, mainly because nobody else was really doing it at the time, did quite well. And I think that was due to a lack of, well, not competition because we've already covered that, but <laughs> a lack of other books out there in the market at the time. It did quite well. And I thought, actually, there's potential there that I can see in this and it could actually be a career in itself and i spent the next five years floundering about trying to make that happen and failing miserably but still absolutely certain that this could be a thing and it took five years to get there and get to the point where it was my my main earner and it become something that i was kind of starting to get known for so yeah i i fell into it accidentally but it really appealed to my entrepreneurial nature i think and my I guess not working too well with other people, being a bit of a loner and uh, not liking to have anyone else to answer to, that appealed as well. So yeah, it's it suits me really well, but you know, I can't take any um, credit for having kind of sorted out or done it deliberately. Have you noticed any big changes since you first started out? Yeah, looking back now, yes. I mean, each change has been quite kind of small and and gradual. I know things like the subscription model, they're probably the biggest changes that we've seen. It makes logical sense that things are kind of moving towards that it has in music it is in film and tv just about every other arts you know consumable arts branch it, it's it's going down that route but you know things kind of change gradually and you don't notice them so much it's only when you look back after 10 years and you think well actually a lot of this stuff just didn't exist things like book bub wasn't around i think well you know how did we actually market and promote books then no wonder we were struggling and floundering and trying to work out how to do it facebook ads didn't exist it's um you know, the idea of having a mailing list and that being you know, your business's biggest asset just just wasn't a thing either it's you know there have been some revolutionary things i guess that have happened and that have changed the direction for indie authors things like or well, facebook advertising and mailing lists and, and somebody cottons onto something that works and it it tends to pass around but yeah i don't think they ever seem revolutionary at the time these these changes kind of creep in it's only when you look back you realize how far things have gone how do you find the indie author community in the UK? It's something I always wonder about because I feel like a lot of conferences and a lot of the focus in the Facebook groups is quite North America centric. And I think you probably know more than I do about that because you're in it. How do you find it in the UK? Is it more niche to be going indie or not? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, there's always, it's always felt as if we're maybe a few years behind in, in some senses. And I think in terms of just you know, market penetration of e-readers, for example, we're, we're always a couple of years behind here in, in things like that. Quite often we can be slow sometimes to get some things. The e-readers arrived here later. You know, some retailers and some promotional outlets will do things in the US and then the rest of the world gets it after. But, you know, just the US alone, even without Canada, I mean, the US is... 10 times the size population wise, I think of the UK. So it is going to be US centric. I get that. What baffles me in the indie author community is how 
from a, a marketing point of view, authors only think about the US and sometimes the UK, if they're in the UK, they don't realize there's such a big wide world out there. I mean, even just with Kobo, I think last time I logged into my dashboards, I've only got books in there in the English language and they're sold in, I think it was 120 countries around the world, which is just insane. When you think about it, you think, you know, everyone's aiming for the US, they're aiming for the UK, maybe doing Canada and Australia occasionally. But it's a massive wide world out there. I think once you get out of that Amazon bubble, which is so UK, US centric, and it's only 5% of the world's population, and you realize that you've been ignoring 95%, it's quite mind blowing, really. It really is. We get a lot of authors actually who contact us because they heard they should go wide specifically from you, Sorry. <laughs> which is amazing. <laughs> no, we love it. So you're one of our biggest cheerleaders, but was going wide something that you've always done? Did you ever dabble in exclusivity or was it always all retailers? No, I did. I did. When Kindle Unlimited started, I, I was there briefly. It didn't quite sit right with me, I guess, with that business mind and entrepreneurial mindset, locking all of my income into one retailer. That was the thing that for me felt most uneasy and you know having especially when things started to kind of kick off and build i didn't fancy the sleepless nights of you know what would happen if i woke up and my dashboard had been locked or an algorithm had decided that i'd done something i hadn't and i, I, I just didn't you know that especially now it's my my family's entire income it i just <laughs> i wouldn't sleep at night if that was the case and you know the other benefits and things have, have crept in over time you know realizing the global reach that retailers like Kobo have and all of the other benefits of being wide and being able to spread that income out and, and have lots of different um, avenues, I think is hugely beneficial. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm such a big cheerleader for Kobo and why, you know, they're my favorite retailer, not just from being an author, but from being a reader as well, try and do as much March through Kobo as I possibly can. I've noticed specifically in the last like month that people have decided to go wide or it's like it's two camps, authors deciding to go exclusive and authors deciding to go wide. Have you specifically changed any of your marketing strategies during the last two months? The global pandemic, I don't know when this episode is coming out, so I should clarify. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll all still remember the global pandemic. Yeah, maybe, it does maybe. come out in a few months' time. <laughs> yeah, no, I have. Like, I guess so, yeah. I mean, I tried to be quite kind of anthropic about it i guess and i um i made one of my box sets the, the most valuable one free and I've, I've been pushing that and trying to get people to come when before the lockdown came in trying to get people to stay at home and read rather than going out and infecting people and that worked quite well actually i think people did actually kind of see it for what it was and um went out and bought other books so that's brought me some new readers and that's been very nice but i've not been aggressively marketing in fact i've been dialing back quite a bit because it just kind of feels wrong to be advertising in in the same way um, i had a book out actually on the 31st of march and i i had you know advertising planned for launch day and things and i i scaled it right back and i i think the most i did on that was send an email out to my mailing list which just had a very very brief mention of the book being out and saying look i feel almost embarrassed emailing you to tell you to this book sound to go and buy that and, and mainly just kind of checking in with people and making sure they're okay so it has changed the approach but it's made me dial it back and i think that has kind of worked in a way i think readers do appreciate that as well so yeah it's you know it's, it's one of those situations where there are there are bigger things than books and there are bigger things than money and you know you just you adapt and, uh, and work with what you've got Absolutely. I think that's an interesting balance with booksellers because nobody wants to be seen to be capitalizing on this because it's awful. But at the same time, it actually is something that helps people to stay at home and helps keep them entertained and mm -hmm. helps to distract them. So it's great to be able to offer that. In yeah, we're, we're in a unique position as writers. You know, we're one of the few people whose incomes aren't going to be affected. And if they are, they're probably going to go up. We can work from home. We don't need to go anywhere. We, we normally don't see a, a person from month to month anyway. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, it's something we can adapt to. And you know, we are needed right now. We are providing that entertainment. The word escapism, I heard so much over the past couple of months. I mean, yeah, readers used to say it every now and again anyway, but it's just becoming a daily occurrence now. Readers talking about escapism and being able to get into a fictional world. I know for me, when I'm writing, I'm feeling much more grateful for the time I'm spending writing because I'm able to escape as well and get into a, a fictional world and, and not this one and no i haven't written the pandemic <laughs> into any of my <laughs> my writing and I'm, I'm deliberately not i think people are just they want the escapism they want to get away from all that have you found that your productivity's 
been affected or that you found it more challenging to focus? Yeah, I have. And a lot of readers have, uh, sorry, a lot of writers have. There was a, a thread in the Indie Author Mindset Facebook group about that. They were talking about not being able to get in the right headspace, not being able to get the words done. You know, there's this, this, this kind of background anxiety. I don't think many of us are sitting there kind of chewing our fingernails going, oh God, the virus is terrible. But it's in the back of all of our minds, no matter what we're doing, it's there. It's this kind of background anxiety that's going on that kind of permeates everything. And again, one of the things I did was I made my productivity for writers course free for, I think, about a month. So that as many people as possible could get hold of that and take that. And a lot of people actually said that their, their productivity had then gone through the roof and they were you know, writing thousands of words a day, which is brilliant. You know, hopefully it kind of cheers people up and gives them that escapism as writers as well as readers. So I was looking at your podcast, Partners in Crime, and I was wondering when you started out with the podcast, were you using it as a marketing tool for your books or was it something you created just as an offshoot? Yeah, no, it's just a bit of fun. I mean, it's still not a marketing tool for the books. And, you know, we very rarely talk about our own books on there. I mean, we, sometimes we don't get around to talking about books at all. <laughs> we just end up talking about coffee and gardening and things like that. But that came about for a, a fellow crime writer, Robert Dawes, who lives about half a mile away from me. And he's also a, a fairly well-known TV actor over here in the UK as well. You know, we used to meet up and talk about books and you know what we've been seeing and watching over a, a coffee or a beer. And I think it was about four years ago, I had a book out and we decided we would film us having a chat and it would be used as part of the launch day thing and we'd upload it to the Facebook group. And that went down really well. And the podcast idea just kind of germinated from that, really. It's just us sitting there as two crime writers talking ideally about what we've been reading, what we've been watching, things we can recommend, crime fiction stuff that's been in the news. But it's kind of evolved into something quite different. We've, we've had massive interviews with you know, some of the biggest crime writers from all over the world. And it's mostly now half an hour a week of us sitting around, messing around, it's good natured. It's it's funny. It's humorous, and you know we have a lot of fun with it. And it's uh, it's light hearted relief for people as well. I think, especially times like this, we've noticed that uh, are very grateful for the the light hearted humor side of things. Oh yeah, we were talking a little bit before we hit record on this about how setting up a podcast or starting a podcast is more challenging than people <laughs> realize. Yeah. And I think right now, I saw Amazon was out of podcast mics because everyone is doing it under lockdown. Yeah. Do you have any advice or tips to anyone who is thinking about it? Well, I think in general, content is king, as, as it is with most things like this. And you, know, you can just record using your phone and using the phone's mic. It's good if you can have the, the right studio equipment. I would say, yeah, definitely be prepared for it being far more work than you realize on all fronts, even just the, the technical side of recording, the technicalities of that, the editing, the mastering, the, the hosting, things cost as well, and trying to find an audience and build it. And you know what, even if you're doing a podcast once a week or once a fortnight, that time comes around really, really quickly. <laughs> and it can often feel like a, it does. a full-time <laughs> job. Yeah, it, it can feel like a full-time job doing it. And I'm, I do two podcasts. So it does take up a lot of time. I've got Partners in Crime and I've got the Indie Author Mindset podcast as well. That's much shorter. That's kind of 15 minutes a week and it's only me. So I don't have to worry about getting other people sorted and in the right place at the right time. So that, that's that's simpler. But yeah, it's good fun. I enjoy it. I've got um, a bit of a broadcasting background as well. And it, it's a nice change from just kind of sitting there writing and, uh, and, and staring at the walls to actually talk to other people and you know, help perhaps inspire or influence and, and what have you. It's, it's all good fun. I've noticed a lot of authors in recent years have started their own podcasts. And I mm -hmm. think it's kind of a cool way to reach readers and something maybe not as like a Facebook group. It's something different. And I don't know, I've noticed mm. more and I've been more interested. And I'm just wondering, do you feel like podcasts could be right for everyone? Because I, f I feel like they could be. It just depends on what you're talking about. It depends. I think from a, an author's point of view, the, a podcast is as right for every author as it is as right for every reader. There'll be a lot of readers and a lot of people who will never listen to a podcast. There'll be a lot of people who will never watch anything on YouTube. There'll be people who don't like to read Facebook groups, but would prefer to watch a video or listen to a podcast. And I think if you can maybe cover as, ba as many bases as possible, then that's a good thing. But you don't want to spread yourself too thinly either. It's a tricky thing. I, I think things are moving that way. Things are moving that way. And I don't think it's vital that people have, have podcasts, but um, there's certainly a lot of fun 
and they're definitely a lot more work than people realize <laughs> as, as I know you guys uh, certainly appreciate I think there are a lot of parallels with indie publishing as well. It's basically, mm-hmm. yeah, it's the indie publishing of the radio. And I yeah. think that in the last few years, there's been some really, really interesting podcasts coming out independently that probably wouldn't have been green, greenlit by a radio show or the BBC or whatever the equivalent is. And yeah, I think yeah. about that a lot with indie publishing. Yeah, people ask me what podcasts are. And the best way I can describe it is that podcasts are to radio what YouTube is to TV. Mm. It's that kind of independently yeah. produced, pre-produced rather than live, even though you can do live podcasting, you can do live YouTube. Yeah, it's it's just a modern take on it. And it is, yeah, you're right. And I've never really looked at it that way. It is what indie publishing is to to, to writing, I guess. it's And maybe that's why it appeals. Maybe that's why I enjoy doing it. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask what you see in the next 10 or 15 years of publishing, if you have any prediction. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's tricky. I don't want to nail my colours to the mask now. Um, I think things hopefully will widen up. I think when you talked about a lot of authors going wide, I think that's, that's certainly something I'm seeing is a big, big direction of travel in, in that direction. I think that was something I had seen coming because over the past year or two, you know, should I go exclusive or wide has always been there ever since KU was introduced and it's always been kind of 50, 50, but I've noticed over the last year or so that it's mainly people who are exclusive, who are kind of asking about going wide and wondering about, you know, how do I do this? What's, you know, should I do it? Should I not? I very, very rarely see an author who is wide saying I'm thinking about going back into KU there's there's not I mean there are some obviously but not that many and yeah there there is certainly a a direction of travel that I'm seeing on that front I think audio books are definitely growing they they've grown hugely over the last year and I know that have been certain industry commentators have said you know every December there's always the you know you get asked what do you see happening next year and Every year, people go, it's audiobooks, it's audiobooks. They've been saying that for about 10 years. Last year, they were actually right. <laughs> <laughs> and audiobooks have, um, have been growing massively. And yeah, more for me for, for not believing them sooner as well, because I've been catching up on that one. But I've definitely seen huge growth over the last year or two in audio. So I don't think there are many huge changes to come. I think maybe, if anything, we might end up moving more towards subscription models, but I think they need to change. I think you know the exclusivity clause in the ones that exist or the main one that exists is restrictive and that is kind of stopping things moving that way. But I wouldn't be surprised if if things moved towards a, a sort of non-exclusive subscription model at some point over the next five years or so. But that needs needs major movement from one particular party. <laughs> <laughs> what a great prediction that may come true. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, because you know, I, think, I think the model is a great idea. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not going to tie myself into one retailer and I wouldn't suggest that anybody does. So I think once that's dropped, you know, I'll, I'll be the first one to, um, to make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm involved, but mm-hmm. yeah, I don't, I don't think exclusivity is, um, is, is a good thing. I don't think, you know, creating monopolies is a good thing either. Absolutely. One thing I would like to ask is, it is a reality that authors who have built their business in Kindle Unlimited, if they move to go wide, they're going to see a drop in sales, Mm -hmm. I think. What would you advise people when they go wide? Well, my outlook on publishing is always that you should be looking at the long term. And Mm -hmm. I'd far rather give up a dollar today to make 10 in a year. And I think that's the way you look at it when you're going wide as well. You know, your income doesn't just drop off a cliff overnight um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I mean, I've not been in KU for five years, but I still get KU page read money every month, probably every week still, because people who have borrowed your books can still read them. They don't, they don't disappear from their devices and the money oh, st- does, still keep, yeah, does, does still keep trickling in. So mm-hmm. it doesn't just drop off a cliff. I mean, you will see an immediate reduction. There's no, no two ways about that. But the interesting thing as well is we've got this kind of obsession as authors and as people in the industry of boxing readers into certain compartments. You know, we think maybe there are, you know, you're a thriller reader or a sci-fi reader. I mean, of course, loads of people read both. Yeah. You know, none of us read just one genre or one really tight type of book. And I think the same happens with devices that people read on. I read on a couple of different devices and I survey my readers on my mailing list every year. I think something like 70, 75% of them have got a KU subscription, but none of my books are in KU but they're all still buying my books Mm -hmm. because, you know, they're on my mailing list and there's no other way to buy them other than 
buying them rather than through a subscription program. So I think a lot of people who do have subscriptions, they don't just read KU books. If they like your books, they're going to be willing to pay for them as well. And frankly, if they're not willing to pay for them, they're probably not readers you want hanging around anyway, because, you know, none of us are doing this or we are doing it for free, but you know, we, we probably still would do it for free, but you know, we want it to be a job and we want it to, to earn enough money so that we can carry on doing it. So the readers you want are the ones who are willing to spend money on your books. And if they don't value them in any way financially, then you ought to ask yourself the question of, whether they're the kind of readers you want to be chasing anyway. That's actually a great point. And it's not really something I'd consider because something a lot of authors are afraid of, like my readers are in KU and if I leave, they might not follow me. Of course they'll follow you. It's mm. true. I would, if I, yeah. if I liked an author, I would venture. Yeah, I, mean, I, I had a KU subscription for years. I don't anymore, but I did for years and I don't buy more books now than I did. I didn't, you know, I don't buy fewer than I do now. If I saw a book that I liked and it wasn't in KU, I'd still buy it it's mm-hmm. you know, people don't go oh i'm only a ku reader it doesn't work like that you know you, you probably will see a drop because some people are on tight incomes and they they will only get books through ku but majority i would say will probably still buy them and of course you've got a big wide world out there you've got the 95 percent of the world where ku isn't even a thing that you can chase through you know, retailers like kobo which country are you selling english language titles and it's the most unexpected Oh, most unexpected. And that's a good question. I mean, I've, I was amazed. I didn't actually look in too closely at what the 120 countries were. I was just <laughs> really, I guess, stunned that there were 120 of them. But there are even countries that aren't English speaking. And I'm looking at it now. I mean, the eighth on the list is the Netherlands. Mm, that's the, yeah. And that's the highest speaking, highest selling non-English language. You know, there are books I'm looking here sold in Russia, Tanzania, Zambia. Colombia, French Guyana, hmm. Philippines, Algeria, Turkey, Georgia, Azerbaijan. I've sold three in apparently. So <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all surprising. And when I look at it everywhere. Yeah. When I, when I think about it, I think you know, 10 years ago, I just wanted somebody I didn't know to pick up one of my books and let me know what they thought. And yeah, I'm now 10 years on. I've got some strange super fan in Azerbaijan, it seems. Amazing. Are your books in Kobo Plus? Yep. I, I think they all are. They should all be. I've uh, not checked, but I do try and make sure they are. Yeah. So we talk a lot about advice for new authors, but I was wondering if you had any advice for established authors who have been publishing for 10 years and it may be the exclusive, non-exclusive thing, but do you have any advice for them? It's difficult really, because I think once you've been doing it for a while, you've, you've kind of got an established direction and it's difficult to know, I guess, what, what positions people are in. But I think one of the things I've noticed recently and i perhaps hadn't realized or appreciated is how much momentum is a thing especially when it comes to kind of algorithms and success in general i think keeping the plate spinning and keeping things going is absolutely key and i think if you do sit back for a few months and don't do anything even if things are going well when you sit back and think oh this is fine i've made it now it will slip back very very quickly and you've got to keep pushing and keep new books coming out and keep doing things and keep finding new readers because we, we often think that our readers are loyal to us and they are to a certain extent, but if they don't hear from us for a couple of months, they'll forget who we are. And we've all read books that we've loved and completely forgotten what they're called, completely forgotten <laughs> the author. So I think maybe you know, keeping those things at the, the front of our minds and being aware that we always need to keep the pressure on and keep momentum going, I think is, is probably a thing that I've, I've noticed the most over the last year or so. What if you do need to take that break for whatever reason? What do you do in terms of keeping your backlist active? Well, yeah, sometimes you do have to. And I've been there myself. Last year, I wasn't well and I had about six months where I didn't work really. But I think if you've got a mailing list and if you have got a backlist, you can do quite a bit with that. I send out an email once a week to my, or about once a week, sometimes once a fortnight to my list regardless. And quite often it will be to do with the backlist title. So I might see something in the news, which is reminiscent of a book that I wrote plot wise. There might be something that influenced a plot or gave me an idea for it. An interesting story, something that happened while I was writing a book. And I will tell my readers that and I will perhaps point out that there's a, a new story that reflects a plot that I've written and then you can say well if you haven't already read that book by the way 
here it is you can go and check it out and then go back to, to talking about it so it's not a hard sell but it is keeping you at the forefront of people's minds it is keeping your books there we would assume that people join our mailing list because they've read the first book in the series then they go and read the second then the third and they consume all of our books in a nice neat order and it just doesn't happen readers skip around all over the place they'll come in at book six and then they'll go and read book three and then book one and then book seven they will not realize how many books you've got out there they're probably not going to go and seek them out they're going to need you to tell them about them so i think just keeping yourself in the forefront of people's minds once every week or two trying to keep an active presence maybe in your your facebook group and things like that just be personable and be straight and honest and upfront with people and you know they'll they will hopefully support you back we were talking to an author, I think a couple of months ago now, and she was saying that she does email marketing and she'll like even ask a question, like one question in an email and she'll get mm-hmm. tons of feedback, which I think is always interesting because people enjoy yeah. hearing from authors. Yeah, they do. And I mean, that has a couple of benefits that obviously opens up dialogue with readers and they get to feel like they know you and they are going to be more likely to become super fans. And from an email marketing point of view, that's a great tip as well, because when your emails are being delivered, and male clients are looking at you know whether you're spam or whether you should go to the priority inbox or what have you. One of the things that really helps your score and your reputation is the interaction that people have with the emails. If they're clicking more, if they're replying, if your emails look like real emails and not like a, a newsletter, you know, here's me telling you some stuff, go and buy it. But you know, just like a normal email, if somebody, a friend or family sends you an email, you reply to it. You know, it, it's mm-hmm. text. It's not you know, laced with images, you're going to reply to it, you're going to engage in conversation. If your emails do that as well, and are, you know, legitimate, normal emails, I guess, and you're, well, again, it's just being open and honest and upfront with people and being normal. I think (laughs) these things, these things just work. Definitely. I haven't thought about it that way, but you're right. Mm. Yeah, even just from a purely cynical point of view, it helps with your sender score and things like that. Your emails are they're, they're more likely to get through and people are more likely to read them. So from a business point of view, it just makes sense and on all fronts, really. So I'm just wondering, what have you been loving lately? My what have I been part? loving? Oh, be anything. Well, we've had some really good weather over here. I'm definitely an outdoors person and you know, I love, love my garden and I will Quite often, if the weather's good, I will take the laptop and I'll go and sit out there and I'll work instead. So, I, you know, sometimes the office I'm in here doesn't doesn't get used for, <laughs> for months on end if we get a really good summer, which is rare in the UK, I must admit. But uh, yeah, the last few days have been pretty rotten. I'm looking out now and the sun's kind of pushing through the clouds, but hopefully that will pick up again in the next few days. And I, I should be sitting outside, loving the sun, loving the garden and doing a bit of reading and writing. Well, in the UK, all the good weather seems to come when they're stuck inside. Apparently, Scotland is warmer than it's ever been. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, um, it's a very British thing that we'd get you know, the best weather we've, we've ever had when nobody's allowed to go out and enjoy it. <laughs> it was always an exam time. May, yeah, that's right. May is always lovely. But yes. <laughs> Where can readers find you online or listeners? Well, my website for my books is adamcroft.net. The indieauthormindset.com as well is for all of the Indie Author Mindset stuff. There's the Indie Author Mindset Facebook group and podcast as well. Hopefully you can uh, pick up some tips there and sell more books. Excellent. And can you remind us, so you talked about the productivity course. What other courses mm-hmm. are you offering with the India Author Mindset? Oh, I've got um, some more books wide, which helps people who you know, going wide, thinking of going wide and, and want to learn the different strategies and different outlook that's required for, for selling books wide as opposed to just with Amazon. Writing killer blurbs and hooks, because that's something I've, I've had a lot of success with. Things like Her Last Tomorrow, Could You Murder Your Wife to Save Your Daughter? And it's all about how to kind of write those kind of hooks and blurbs that will hook readers in. I've got one for formatting books with vellum and getting you know really good looking books, which which readers like. Yeah, there's there's quite a few there now, and I'm I'm adding new ones all the time. So yeah, that list will will probably have changed again by the time listeners hear this. Excellent. Well, we'll share the link and then they can find them all. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming on today and taking the time to talk to us. This was really good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast. If you're looking for Adam's books, we will have linked to them on our blog. Or if you're interested in learning how to grow your sales, visit kobowritinglife.com. This episode was produced by Joni DiPlacido and Stephanie McGrath. Editing is by Kelly Robotham. Music is provided by Tearjerker. And big thanks to Adam for being a guest today. If you're ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing.